Hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Last session of the day of a two-day conference. Uh, I hope you had a great time, and thanks for hanging in there with us. Um, we saved the best for last. This is going to be the best session of the conference. We have some Never. superstar. No pressure. <laughs> we have superstar panelists here who have started companies, started multiple companies, uh, and invest and uh, get more companies going. VCs here. So we've got some great panelists. Um, a few things to start. There are two microphones out here, and we want you to ask questions throughout. So I'm going to start with a few questions. I'll be looking at the mics to see if you're up there uh, to ask questions. And we want to do that throughout the session. OK, so don't make me ask all the questions. All right? Um, let me ask a couple questions right now. How many of you are not from Silicon Valley? Oh, awesome. How many of you are not from the United States? Awesome. That's great. OK, great. Um, first, let me introduce our panelists. Um, Paul Bukait, the inventor of Gmail, um, left Google and started FriendFeed. FriendFeed was acquired by Facebook. Um, he stayed at Facebook for a while, uh, then left. And now he's a venture capitalist at Y Combinator one of the premier startup incubators in Silicon Valley. Uh, Joe Kraus, founder of Excite, one of the very first search engine portals on the web, uh, very successful, merged with At Home, so it became Excite At Home. Uh, later, the founder of Jotspot, a uh, really cool startup that was acquired by Google. Uh, stayed with Google for several years and now is a venture capitalist at Google Ventures. And to my right here, Seth Prebach. He's the founder of Scavenger. Um, he'll tell you a little bit more about that, but it's a, a really cool game that you can play based on location and go around and find things like a scavenger hunt. Uh, it's a really cool game. And Scavenger is a portfolio company of Google Ventures. So he's in the family. So this session is about how to take an idea from a nights and weekends kind of project that you're hacking on to a funded startup. And how do you get there? All three of these guys have done it several times. So I think that's the first question. Tell us how you did that. How did you go from idea stage to hacking something, to finding a f another co-founder, to getting some angel investment, to getting venture capital. Let's start with Seth. Cool. Uh, just want to make sure I'm doing this right. Can everyone hear me OK? Cool. Uh, so so uh, I started Scavenger when I was a, a freshman at Princeton um, and, and started working on it there, doing math and computer science. Uh, and, and basically, the, the um, the lineage of the idea was about taking game mechanics, moving them into the real world, trying to play a game literally everywhere, and um, taking it from that to uh, actually being something that, that looked a bit more like a company was sort of a, a messy process. Um, I, I brought it to one of my computer science professors, this guy Adam Finkelstein, and said, hey, I have this cool idea. There's a Princeton business plan competition coming up. Um, will you help me put together um, you know, just enough to make it look like the product sort of works? Um, and we did that, and we hacked together a few scripts in Python, and it was literally running on a server um, underneath my bed in my dorm room, which if we had ever vacuumed, the, the circuit would have blown and the whole thing would have gone down. Um, but uh, ended up winning the, the business plan competition, and that was sort of a, a key turning point for us. Um, and then um, sort of made the leap of faith and, and decided to drop out of school, because uh, that's what, what all the cool kids were doing at that point, and I figured I should, I should follow along. Um, and. and, and uh, I think that's probably the, the, the best short answer I have to it, that you know, I found a couple friends at, at, at college, I found one professor, um, got into a business plan competition which uh, you know, gave us some credibility and then sort of took a leap of faith to, uh, to jump into one of the incubator programs. We went with Dream Adventures um, and uh, sort of started it from there. Great. Joe? Yeah, for me, uh, I'll talk about my first company, which was uh, Excite back a while ago now, 1993. I started it right out of college. We did the the route where we borrowed uh, money from our, each of, we had six co-founders, we borrowed money uh, from our parents. We borrowed $15,000 total uh, and basically set up shop in our garage. 
and the kind of two things that I would basically say, one is that um, persistence played a huge role for us in moving from nights and weekends to uh, a funded company in that we just never gave up trying to get money. And the second is that opportunity creates opportunities in ways that are hard to predict. Our funding cycle literally went like this. I got a book uh, when I graduated from my then college girlfriend, which was uh, by a guy named Bob Cringely, who still writes an online column, and it was called Accidental Empires, and it was about the gossip history of Silicon Valley. In the book it said, tips for entrepreneurs, call me, I'm a cheap date. I call him, we go out to lunch. He's, he's interested in what we're doing, he says, I want to join the company. I said, great, I, mean, I don't know anything at this point, I'm you know, brand new, and I thought, oh, this you know, author wants to join our company, we've made it. Um, he eventually doesn't join, but he introduces us to his parent company, which was IDG, a uh, big publishing company at the time. Uh, they gave us our first $100,000 contract back in 1994 to put all their archives online. One of the people I met there said, if you do a good job, we'll introduce you to our board. And so we did a good job, and they introduced us to their board, and one of their board members happened to be a venture capitalist named Steve Coit out at, in Boston at Charles River Ventures. Steve said, I'm kind of interested in what you guys are doing, um, but I need a West Coast partner. So he introduced us to a guy named Jeff Yang, who was then at IVP, now at Redpoint. Jeff said, yeah, I don't really know what to do with you, but he introduced us to Vinod Kosla. Vinod uh, was, we met with Vinod, and his first question, unlike everybody else's, which was, how are you going to make money? His first question was, does your technology scale? We said, we don't know. We can't afford a hard drive big enough to test. He buys us, right then, five minutes later, a $10,000 hard drive, which, by the way, in 1994 was 10 gigs. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and basically, that led to us getting a $3 million financing from Kleiner Perkins, in that case, without a business plan. And the reason I tell that story is, you could not predict from a book that I received from my college girlfriend to a $3 million financing from Kleiner Perkins how that chain of events would have happened. But one thing led to another. Opportunities created opportunities in ways I couldn't predict. And the second is we were persistent. To me, it's the number one characteristic of amazing entrepreneurs is they persist. So that's, that'd be my nights and weekends a transition. All right, so uh, that's a great answer. <laughs> uh, my, my story. It's a little different. Um, <laughs> it makes noise. All right. So uh, I was very interested in startups when I moved out here, but I didn't know anything uh, you know, about them or, or anything like that. So I did the only thing I could. And again, the idea being you don't really know where the path leads, I decided I would simply join a startup and then hopefully learn in that way. Uh, and so luckily, the startup I joined was Google. <laughs> Um, so it's just a simple matter of <laughs> good choosing. Uh, yeah, of joining Google in 1999. Nice dart. Yeah, um, and you know I was there for a long time, obviously, and I a lot longer than I expected. I, I never thought Google would really last. It seemed like a <laughs> flash in the pan. Yeah, <laughs> I mean with Alta Vista there, I don't. It's hard to see how Google could really make it. I was at Alta Vista at that same time. Yeah, and look where I ended up. Alta Vista was huge. I got, I, I got you all beat there. I had the <laughs> opportunity to buy Google. And I failed to do so. So how about that? <laughs> how that for egg in the face? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I mean that was obviously a, a great experience for me, and um, you know it achieved my goal of learning something about startups and also just meeting a lot of great people. So when uh, sometime after I left FriendFeed, um, I was getting together with friends from Google. Uh, first Sanjeev Singh, who was the second person from Gmail. We started talking about startup ideas and also other people who we might be interested in, uh, you know, have, having come on board with the startup as well. And so we kept an eye on who else might be coming out of Google because there were lots of good people at Google. Uh, and ultimately ended up talking with uh, Brett Taylor and Jim Norris, who were also interested in doing a startup. And the four of us together finally uh, formed FriendFeed um, sometime later. And so, you know, at that point, I think our story differs quite a bit from most startups because. Um, because of our history, which is a little bit unusual. Uh, you know, Brett had started, more or less started Google Maps, um, and Sanjeev and I had done, had done Gmail. So we had an advantage over most startups in terms of being able to raise money um, and such. We actually tried to avoid raising money. And, uh, but still, just that, that idea of never knowing where the road leads, and you always just kind of have to go forward. And um, you know, certainly the, the deal with selling the company to Facebook was sort of a surprise because they were always trying to buy us and we always said no, never. And then one, we, <laughs> and one day we sold, um, kind of by surprise. 
Uh, and again, you know, the, where I am now in terms of Y Combinator just kind of happened spontaneously out of that same process of just meeting people, talking to people. Um, in the case of YC, I've actually been involved since uh, about 2006, initially just investing in the companies. And every batch, I would invest in more and more companies. And at some point, I was already investing in so many of the companies, it just made sense for me to join uh, full time. And that's, that's how I got to where I am now. So, Paul, you had four founders in FriendFeed. Right. Joe, you had six co-founders in Excite. Seth, you did it by yourself. Why don't you have a co-founder? <laughs> no, no one liked me. It was... <laughs> uh, no, no uh, well, maybe, but, but I'm not sure that was totally relevant. Um, uh, for, for, for me, uh, Scavenger is by far the, 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 the most successful and most interesting startup that I've done, but I, I had done two previous ones. Um, Giftopedia I'd founded uh, when I was much, much younger, um, and it, it failed gloriously. Um, the thing just, just totally blew up. Um, but I'd sort of been, um, b been used to doing uh, things by myself on that, and I think a lot of, um, a lot of the stories you hear are about um, uh, founders looking for founding partners, and, 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 and that's one very successful model, and there's obviously a huge amount of data, a huge amount of stories to, to showcase the success on that. Um, for myself, personally, uh, I, I sort of wanted to get it to a stage where uh, where I knew, you know, at least what I was doing, where I had some level of proof of concept and then went the route of uh, looking for, for really solid advisors and looking to build out a team very quickly. Uh, so by the time I, I started building out a team, uh, we had, you know, I, I knew what the product was going to be. I knew at least sort of what it looked like. It's obviously evolved a tremendous amount and continues to evolve. But, um, but for me, the, the, the founding um, uh, portion was something that I, I, I'm much more comfortable doing myself and then realizing what I'm very weak at um, sales was a big thing I was weak at, marketing was a big thing I was weak at, and finding the right people uh, to help me do that, um, but at a slightly later stage than, than, than looking for a founding, uh, a founding partner. Actually, for anybody who is out there starting companies, I talked to somebody about this last night. Um, the data actually suggests uh, and supports the notion that there is a positive increase in successful outcome as you add numbers of co-founders up till about four. Uh, there's just no data past four. So you are more likely to succeed as you add co-founders to your business. Um, I don't know exactly, nobody knows exactly why, but there is that positive we've, correlation. We've certainly noticed this at, at Y Combinator because we have, at this point, I don't know, three or 400 startups. And two, two or three co-founders <coughs> seems to be the sweet spot. Um, one is just very difficult a lot of times because uh, ultimately startups end up having really difficult times. And it's easier if you're, if you're not all alone when, when things are, are awful. Uh, and and uh, we're not really sure why you know, going up four, five, six is bad. But it, uh, our, our sort of theory is that it, it's just sort of an indication that there's no, that there's almost like a, a little bit of fear in the group. That, uh, I mean, I, I obviously, like now I'm talking about both of our companies, which worked out OK. But we've, we've seen that sometimes when there's that many people, it kind of indicates that none of them is, is quite as committed. They're not, they don't have what it takes to make it with two or three. And so they kind of get more and more people almost out of fear. <laughs> Paul, uh, I believe Y Combinator doesn't accept companies th of one. Oh, founder. no, we absolutely right? do. Uh, do and, yeah, uh, in fact, probably one of the most successful Y Combinator companies of all time, which is Drop Dropbox, uh, was originally a single founder. And then he found a co-founder. Um, so he was accepted as a single founder, and then he found a co-founder um, later on. But we have several uh, single founders in every group. Uh, Joe, as a venture capitalist, when you look at investments, um, do you like it when there are co-founders or several co-founders? Uh, or how do you look at that? Um, well, obviously, it depends on stage. But if we're talking about something early stage, seed or A round, the things that we definitely look for and that we have in a pretty broad analysis of uh, a lot, a lot, a lot of companies and data have found is one is, yes, there's a positive correlation between number of co-founders. Second is, have you worked together in the past is really important as a, a kind of predictive indicator of likely success. And that's just primarily like, have you gone to battle together before? Do you like each other at the end of it? Can you communicate honestly with one another? Do you resolve disagreements without just striking the middle ground and having the easy answer? But some, oftentimes, somebody winning an argument is actually more important than trying to kind of thread the middle. Um, so having worked together. And then lastly, the thing that is positively correlated to success is 
you know, this is obvious, but like, do you actually know the domain you're, you're, you're pursuing? Um, you know, startup founders who have, do their second startup are actually no more likely to succeed in their second startup if they're in a brand new domain. So, like for me, I was, I did a consumer internet startup in Excite. When I went and did Jotspot, which was really focused on small to mid-sized business, by the numbers, I was at no greater an advantage having done a startup before. Um, mainly because your go-to-market strategy is so much different. Um, the way you sell, the way you market, how you understand your customers is so much different. But bottom line, in early stage companies, the stuff that we like to see, obviously, if you've done it before, that's great. Uh, multiple co-founders is good. Uh, having worked together in the past and hopefully in a domain that you're you know, operating in a domain you understand uh, and have some deep expertise in. Those are all kind of obvious things, but some of the stuff that we certainly look for. I look at co-founders as validation. Right. If, if there are several co-founders, that means that more than one crazy person agreed that this is a great thing to do. Yeah, you cast a good reality distortion field over a large number of people. That can be helpful. Right. Because there's lots of crazy people, myself included, who have ideas every day. But I think the validation of an idea is when you can convince someone else to drop what they're doing and join you in your idea. If you can get two or three people to do that, then that's pretty good validation that you might be on to something. And if you can't convince two or three people to drop what they're doing and join you, you should think really hard about what you're doing. Now, Seth and others are exceptions to that, but as an investor, that's, I weight that pretty heavily. So we have questions here, so let's start over here. Quick question. So any ballpark information as far as does adding co-founders increase your chances by 10%, 500%? Also, you said there's no data past four. Is there any drop-off sort of leveling off? So adding one co-founder quintuples your chances, but adding the fourth one is only 10% increase. Yeah, I don't know the data explicitly. This is actually public research that's been done, um, academic research that's been done on this particular point. I don't know the name of the paper, but um, and I don't know how to get you the name of the paper. Maybe out of the Google Ventures Twitter account, we can tweet that particular paper that was that, that details the answers to that. And the reason there's nothing above four is, is there's just not many companies that start with five co-founders or six or whatever. Hi. Um, today, what do you think is more important, traction or product? Oh, in my opinion, mm -hmm. traction for sure. I mean, look, there's always the internal debate in a company. What matters more? Does the team matter most? Does the product matter most? Does the market matter most? And oftentimes, I think most people understand that it's an interplay of the three. Uh, and that oftentimes it's heavily dependent upon what stage you're actually making that evaluation. So a company that's doing 200 million in revenue and you know, $50 million of free cash flow, well, their market matters a lot because it's an ongoing concern and you want to know how much expansion there's going to be into the company. Uh, sorry, how much expansion of the revenue uh, of the market over the company there can be. Um, way dialed back to the early stage. Um, what's really interesting is anybody here read a book called The Checklist Manifesto? No, I don't recommend it, actually. Um, <laughs> but because uh, I, I can summarize it in a, in a word, in a, like a few sentences, which is people who are really expert at something are great at telling other people how to do it and really bad at following their own advice. So the classic example here is medical doctors who are, let's say you're a pulmonologist. I can tell Don here, here's how I screen for some, whether somebody has lung cancer. Then when you watch what that doctor actually does, nothing related to what they actually told Don to do. Um, and that's why pilots have checklists, right? So there's just no notion of expertise uh, bias. Well, the, I, um, the thing here is that if you actually ask and survey wide swaths of venture capitalists, especially in the early stages, what's the most important thing? In the very early stages, they'll all say team. When you watch what they spend their time doing due diligence on, they do diligence on the product and the market. Um, and so there's a mismatch between what people say is important and what they actually do. So the question as an investor is, how do you create a system or a bias towards doing what you know to be important? Um, and so sorry, long-winded answer, but in my opinion, in the early stage, it, for me as at least, is all team. Thank you. Okay. So this is mostly, I think, an ethical question. How do you know when your product is too big for your current company? Like, you, look, you talked about Gmail specifically. That was something. How did you know that was right for Google? versus striking it out on your own, whereas with friend feed, that was something, you know, that social networking has always been kind of something Google might do. How did you have the clarity to know that that was right to do on your own? Uh, I think doing Gmail as a startup would have been a lot harder. Um, the resources required 
I mean, just in terms of all the hardware, or everything else, um, not to mention just the, the brand value of Google. You know, are you going to trust your email to some company you've never heard of? I think that's less likely. By the time we launched Gmail, um, you know, Google was pretty well known and pretty well respected, and people trusted it. People trusted switching over. If it was you know, some friend feed mail, you might be like, well, I'll give it a few years, right? Uh, so, and obviously, I mean, there's counterexamples. Hotmail was a startup, but at the time, they didn't really have any competition. So I think, I think it would have been a lot harder to do that as a startup because it benefited a lot from Google's um, brand and technology and everything else. Uh, other startups, I, I think the, have, having an attachment to a big company like Google could even be a hindrance. Um, you know, again, maybe, it, I don't know, I'm not going to go into the Google social social experimentation, but so certainly like, you can see where, where people might actually be more comfortable thinking this is like a new product um, and, and the ability to move very quickly and take unusual directions um, and not be hindered by a lot of the big company apparatus. Uh, and Facebook you know, might be a good example of that. You know, it's written in PHP, which would never have been allowed at Google. <laughs> uh, but you know, it's very successful. Uh, and, and, but I, I think if they were subjected to a big company process, they wouldn't have been able to make the big bets, take the big gambles, um, you know, anger millions of people, and whatever else it took for them to, to become number one. Thanks. Over here. Hi. Uh, can you give your views on uh, working with archangels versus working with early stage VCs? Uh, I, Archangel, I, I, like super angels, is that the, you know, I, I don't know, I think the lines have gotten pretty, pretty blurred. Um, I, I don't know that there's, a, that there's any simple answer. It really depends on how much money you're needing to raise. You know, if you're going to do a large Series A or something like that, you're probably going to end up at a, at a standard VC. Uh, also, in terms of how much you're going to have to give up, if you do a Series A, typically you're going to give a board seat or maybe two board seats, you're going to give away you know, 20 to 30 percent of your company, but if you're doing a seed round with with regular angels or super angels, you might be you know, giving away much less. You might only sell off five or 10 percent of your company, um, but typically you're getting a lot less money. It probably won't last you until profitability or or even you know maybe more than a six to 12 months. I personally view it as who do you fundamentally believe can help you build your business? Like it's it's. It comes down to your choice of who you want to help fund you should, in my opinion, not be based at all on firm, on position, on whether they fit, you know, super angel, angel, early stage VC. It's fundamentally about do you have a good relationship with that person? And I always use the caller ID test, which is if that person calls you and you look at the caller ID, are you excited to pick up the phone or are you like, oh, crap? Um, <laughs> And the investments that I've always kicked myself for fail the caller ID test, but where I get greedy, I'm like, oh, it's going to be an awesome business. And then invariably, you know, stuff changes, but I'm still getting the calls. Um, and, you know, so it's, it really is fundamentally, can people, do you, fun, do you believe that you've got the people that can help you, give you advice, uh, and kind of steer you right more than, you know, one bucket or another? So, Seth, you raised angel capital money and venture capital money. Um, so you've gone through both processes. Um, what kind of decision did you go through in choosing your investors, or did you just take any money that would come, or how did you go through that? Sure. So, so uh, f from our perspective, we, we, you know, we went through an, an incubator, Dream Adventures, uh, which was based in Philadelphia, is now based in Philadelphia and New York, and they're sort of you know, they, 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 they're structured like a VC, but they're really an angel. You know, it's a tiny round. They give you 35K. They take 6%, sort of the standard model. Uh, you sleep on the floor, eat ramen noodles, build things as fast as you possibly can. Uh, and then we basically had a choice to, um, you know, sort of what to figure out after that. Uh, I, I decided I wasn't going back to school at that point. I mean, we, and we looked at the angel versus VC um, sort of dichotomy, and our initial reaction was to go with, uh, with an angel round. Uh, we were looking to raise about three quarters of a million dollars, um, and, and we figured, you know, that's probably more of an angel size thing than, than a VC thing. Um, but we went out and we talked to a bunch of VCs, and, and what we found was, um, you know, we went sort of the, you know, the, the unusual route. I think at this point, a lot of people are going the super angel route. Uh, we ended up going with Highland Capital, uh, which is a, you know, a large VC. They've got two or three billion dollars under management. Um, and they agreed to do a tiny round. Uh, you know, they're not used to writing checks for, 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 for that small amount of money. They've actually gotten into it a little bit more now. Um, but we figured if, if, a, if a company, 
that, you know, or, or a venture firm that's used to investing in businesses that are much, much bigger was willing to spend their time with us, even if they weren't putting that much money to work, uh, that that was probably a very good bet for us. And so we ended up going with them, and they've, they've since participated in our uh, two follow-on rounds and have been hugely helpful. Uh, we've now raised about $20 million from Google Ventures and also Balderton Capital. And, um, you know, from our perspective, again, Scavenger is the only serious company that I've really done, but my recommendation would be if you can get, if you can get a large VC uh, to put a small amount of money in you, uh, the real value you're getting is the time, and so you can get a lot of leverage for that if they'll do terms that are reasonably equivalent to what an angel might do. Uh, hello, uh, question across the board. I was curious if you could speak a bit about what has kept you motivated over the years, both before and after your success, uh, other than massive amounts of money. <laughs> you know, I, when I did my second startup, almost every employee uh, that I was trying to hire asked me this question. And the truth doesn't sound, it is the truth, it just does, it's not satisfying for most people, but it is what it is which is I love the personal relationships that you form in a startup when you get a group of people trying to do the impossible. Um, there's, it is the closest, you know, I'm now married with three kids and like I just, I don't get to spend a lot of time with people that aren't in my family. And the kind of closest to that collegiate experience where you're spending a ton of time with people, there's kind of this, it's this crucible moment um, that's what I get out of startups. And so all of my closest relationships really come from uh, the companies that I've done because you go through these experiences where like literally you don't have, we had this at, at Excite, you know, like you literally don't have the next payroll in the bank and you're trying to figure out what to do. Um, you go through these ups, the celebratory experiences where something great happened and where something bad you know, horrible happens, and um, so for me at least, it's the relationships that you form when you try to do these things. How about you, Paul? Yeah, that's right. I mean, I, I think that's actually one of the things that, in my mind, is a big differ differentiator from startups versus uh, some other environments is the extent to which you're really close to the team and you're kind of choosing the people you're around. Um, especially if you've started the company, you literally choose the people you're working with. Uh, but also, there's a, just the creative aspect of, of launching new things all the time. And uh, I mean, I, I don't know, that's just fun for some people. <laughs> and, it's, and it's certainly something that I, uh, I think enjoyed most just at FriendFeed is that every day I'd go in, I'd write something new and I'd launch it. And just being able to get things out there that quickly, to, to have an idea and move from idea to implementation to like having it out to the world and people telling me that they hate it or they love it or whatever in such a short period is, uh, it's kind of intoxicating. It's, it's, a, it's just a lot more fun than, you know, most of the things that people, it's more fun than, I don't know, whatever it is people pay to have fun. <laughs> like it's more fun than most vacations, you know, to actually like build things and launch them. Uh, and, you know, and that's, that's a big part. Obviously there's, there's the, the, the flip side that, you know, then like at 4 a.m. you get called because like a server is broken and you've got to wake up and fix it. I didn't really care for that part so much. Uh, so, you know, th th there's a balance. And, and, uh, but, but even, you know, what I'm doing now, I get to be involved in the creative side of things because people come to me with problems or, you know, we're looking at a product and, and you can kind of explore solutions. And then, you know, next time I talk to the people a week later, they've tried it out and told me that, you know, it didn't work or, or it did work or whatever, but it gets that same creative cycle. Of, of exploring the world and trying out new ideas. So, so I, I've got a totally unconventional and probably uh, n not likely to be popular uh, response to this one, but you know, Sca Scavenger is a company all about game mechanics, um, and, and, and we've certainly, um, we've still got a lot of work to do, but we've certainly done well. We're, we're, we're two years in, and uh, we raised our last round north of 100 million, so we're, we're, we're doing well. Um, but uh, we very, and I very explicitly try and manage my own motivation um, using mechanics, and the way I do it is lack of alternatives. Um, realistically, uh, you know, you take out uh, everything else that could possibly make you uh, excited or successful or happy, and you replace that with what you're doing at your company. Uh, and if you've I got, I love you. If, if you've got, no, no, you're, you're not going to like this one, and it's, and it's not popular, and it's probably not recommended if you want to be um, happy. Uh, but 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 it's recommended <laughs> if you want to be, you know, if you want to build your company to 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 be, you know, as big as you can possibly make it. 
Um, you know, I, I, I built uh, uh, my whole incentive structure um, so that I don't draw salary. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't have a super active social life. Uh, I left Princeton and I decided I was going to do scavenger. Uh, and that was it. Um, and it's sort of the thing, if you really want your troops to fight hard, you burn the ships and you've got nowhere to go. And if you, if you build yourself to have only that, that that is the thing you are doing, then you're absolutely motivated to do it because there's nothing else. And it sounds a little stark and it sounds sort of a little cruel and you know, almost masochistic, but it's really not. It's, it's a very almost zen-like state where you wake up in the morning and you know that there's absolutely nothing else in your life that you have to do except build a company. And I'm in a weird state, right? I, I, I sleep at the office. I don't, I don't have an apartment. I outsource laundry to my parents. Like, it's a wonderful, blessed, bizarre life. But, um, you know, but if you can do that, if you can convince the office to bring in breakfast and lunch and dinner so you don't have to worry about making food and you can remove all alternatives and everything else you have to focus on, then you will keep yourself motivated on what you're building. Uh, and, and that, you know, not, not, not going to be a super popular one, not going to get in a book anywhere, but, uh, but, it, but it definitely works. Motivation is incredibly important in, in starting a company. It, it is everything. Motivation and competition. If you remember, you know, when you were kids and you played sports, team sports, and the adrenaline rush that you get from a band of brothers out there trying to defeat the enemy and just practicing so hard and getting so committed to doing something, and then the thrill of victory when you actually win, well, when you're adults, you don't have an opportunity to do that. The sports are gone. And for me, startups are like adult sports. You build a team, you go against the competition, you wake up every morning and you can't wait to get there and, and to beat the competition. And there's nothing else like it. it, it once it's in your blood, you can't, you can't get away from it. Uh, question over here. Um, when you find a company that you're uh, looking to invest in, how do you come up with a number of what you think that company is worth? Do you listen to the, the seller, or do you come in with a number? And is it 10 times sales, one time sales, valued on EBITDA? Just... Uh, for, it, it's obviously heavily dependent upon stage. So again, if you're investing in a late stage company with serious public comparables, it's a much easier valuation exercise. You might value it on a multiple of free cash flow. You might value it on a multiple of EBITDA. You would value it relative to those things relative to its growth rate. But most investing by VCs is not that style of investing. Most investment by VCs is investing at a much earlier stage with much less perfect information. Um, actually, I think the, the um, it is, in my opinion at least, more art than science, the valuation game. Um, and it is subject hugely to human dynamics. So like I'm a, I'm a big poker player. I love playing poker. Um, and it's clear that, obviously, competitive dynamics increase your valuation pretty dramatically. Um, that, sadly, I think most uh, venture investors are subject to a huge set of herd behavior um, and um, what I would call FOMO, fear of missing out. So I think if you want to play the game against the investor, uh, you've got to realize that investors have a, for some reason, a much greater fear of missing out on a great deal than a worry about striking out on a deal that they see in front of them. And that's very anti-Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett's view is there's no called strikes in investing, only hit pitches that you think you can knock out of the park. But it's very hard in a kind of a competitive environment for most investors to stay true to that. So. Um, and then the last thing I would say is that oftentimes investors through, I don't know who's read predictably irrational, but the notion of an anchor price, um, oftentimes, oddly, conversations around valuations revolve around what the entrepreneur said that they wanted instead of an independent, like, what do we think it's worth? And it takes discipline inside the investing rooms to actually create um, some, you know, to create a valuation from scratch without being anchored by what the, the entrepreneur said. So, kind of flip that around, I would, if I were you, I'd mention a price. Um, the, Definitely. <laughs> just, just, <laughs> um, the second thing is just recognize the psychology and how competition plays into it. Now, you, you, you know, you gotta be careful on the game in the sense that what you don't over-optimize, if you find somebody you really wanna work with, then it's really not worth um, jerking around because a 10% premium relative to the chance of losing the person that you think can make the difference isn't worth it to the long run of the business. 
So hopefully some of that was helpful. Over here. So my friend always asked me to like come up with a business plan and he'll give it to some of his investor friends and see if anything would happen. But say you don't know how to make a business plan and also that your idea is kind of out there and you don't really, there's no really statistics or numbers to back your idea up. How would you go about getting your idea funded without a business plan, if it's possible? So, uh, <laughs> no, no company that YC funds ever has a business plan. Um, we basically, again, it's the team is a big part of it and then, you know, just look at, at the idea. And specifically, does the team understand the idea? But at an early stage for kind of high-tech startups, there usually aren't really any numbers that you can look at. You can't say this is going to be our revenue in year five. When people do that, it's all fiction. Um, and some people do that because they think it's, it's an obligation. But when you look at it, there's <laughs> no one could have ever predicted like what Google's revenue was going to be at like whatever year, right? Uh, so so that, that kind of any time spent on that sort of thing, you know, that, that makes sense for a sandwich shop or something like that where the business is kind of predictable. If you're starting some, some you know, Facebook or something, you're not, <laughs> there's no way you can predict any of those numbers. Uh, and so we ultimately just invest in uh, people at an early stage, which isn't to say that the idea doesn't matter because if someone comes to you with an idea that seems really, really bad, that kind of reflects on the person. <laughs> um, or it might just be a really brilliant idea which is always the intriguing thing with bad ideas, is that they're either bad or brilliant. Uh, and that's where you want to talk to the team and find out, have they thought through you know, kind of the obvious flaws. If you ask them, well, what about, you know, if your plan is to like, give away free gold bars, you say, like, where do you get the money to get the free gold bars? And think, oh, I didn't get that. You know, that would be a bad <laughs> sign. Um, but you know, maybe they have a machine that makes gold. <laughs> and they go, OK, you know, <laughs> this we can work with. Uh, so it, it really, at the early stage, yeah, don't, you don't worry about, about uh, business plans. Just build a product. That's really the most compelling thing, is if you can actually demonstrate that you have something that is useful and that people like. So don't spend any time on that. Just build something, get users, uh, you know, get traction if that's possible, and that will make you stand out. Uh, to, to jump in on that, we, we wrote a business plan uh, for the business plan competition um, and never used it again. Uh, uh, Highland never asked for it. Uh, Google Ventures never asked for it. Boulderton never asked for it. I still, I still have it, uh, and it's, it's really good looking and sounds super professional and is totally wrong. Uh, but you know, I, I, I would say you should never write a business plan except for a business plan competition, because uh, winning those is useful. Um, but, but they're the only ones who really care. Okay, over here. Hi, I'm uh, interested in the field of intellectual property. Uh, yeah. What's your view of uh, funding? Uh, I mean, the part of uh, intellectual property, patents, uh, trademarks, all this stuff. Uh, should I work into it? Do you consider it as a plus in uh, considering uh, funding? Uh, you know, there's differing views on this. My own personal view is no. Um, here's why. I think that it's really only valuable to any company that would acquire you. Um, because small companies have no ability to prosecute their patents. Most of the time you're walking in with um, patent applications and you've got multi years before it grants. You don't even know if the company's going to survive to that stage. And then lastly, most patents aren't actually foundational or fundamental in some way, they're incremental. And so they're usually used for defense more than offense. Somebody sues you, you basically countersue, you've got kind of competing claims, you do a free cross license. They're rarely used to effectively uh, to, they're rarely used to affect the outcomes of competitors or other companies as a startup. Now, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, somebody big buys you, that, and you have something foundational, that will improve your valuation. But I think the chances, for the most part, are slim relative to the ability of actually making a business of substance. Um, so it, it's, not a high, it's not a high focus. Um, there are certain areas where it is more of a focus, but in kind of traditional, certainly in kind of consumer internet businesses, Here. My question is especially for Paul and Joe. I'm the founder of a small enterprise software company. We have a lot of traction in a small niche, and we are going after a very large market that's growing really fast. When you look at a company like that, what are some things that turn you on, and what are some things that turn you off? Uh, well, you know, at the stage that I invest is usually like the very early stage, and so again, it comes down to the team. 
And if the team believes in the idea and the team seems good, we just go with it. <laughs> because the assumption is you know, you know better than we do. Um, that said, enterprise sales is notoriously difficult. Um, and, but I, I don't, I, I think the, the question you're asking might be a little later stage and, and more to, to Joe's. Yeah, uh, it's tough at that level of, you know, uh, at that level of pitch, it's hard to give you kind of specific advice. Um, but my sense is where I would quickly dive in in that conversation is just, one, I'd want to understand the dynamics of the market that you're selling into today. How are you selling into it? Is it direct sales? Is it indirect? Is it over the phone? Is it field sales? How do you compensate those people? What's the title of the people that you're selling to? And then I would want to understand, is that pattern relevant to the pattern into this larger market? Or is it a new pattern? Um, and I would want to also understand, is this going to require a heavy lift with regard to upgrading the team? So suddenly, the people that were really good at this niche market, well, are they the right people? Or are we going to have to hire a bunch of new people to attack this bigger market? So that would be the line of questioning that I would start going down at the level of detail that you've given me. Hi, I have a two-part question. Um, it seems like the team is very important. And it also seems like a lot of these Google App Engine where the hardware has become less important. And it seems like startups are actually getting cheaper to start at this point, um, easier to take a risk. Um, so I'd like your views on outsourcing. Basically, you know, now that we don't have to pay the money on hardware, I'd rather invest in local talent and keep the team together. And I'm just wondering how you guys feel about you know, the cost of startups and how outsourcing affects that or shouldn't affect it. Uh, outsourcing of what? Um, coding, in particular. Uh, well, I mean, if you're a technology company and you outsource the coding, you're, you're basically outsourcing the thing that you do uh, to a large extent. machine. Yeah. But you see, uh, you see a lot where the CTO will be someone local, and then they'll outsource the, the dirty work. And yeah, I mean, I don't agree with that. I'm just wondering. No, I, I mean, there's no. It's not like an ethical thing. Um, it's just that. It's, I mean, sometimes that works, but I, I haven't really seen a lot of examples of that. It, um, I've seen a lot of people try, and it can sometimes work if you're really on the ball. Um, but the fact is that it's very hard to get really top quality developers, even when you're carefully screening them, you go through a long interview process, you've, and you're, you're managing them locally. Um, when you're just picking up people off of you know, a website, I, I think the quality that you're going to get just isn't as high. Now, if the actual technology that you're building is something very basic, and that's not at all fundamental, you just need to you know, customize your WordPress template or something, I think that can work fine. But if, if you're building something where technology is a core part of the business, I think that you're going to run into a lot of trouble. As a general rule, I don't like it at all early stage. Um, there are always exceptions to the rule. In particular, if this entrepreneur has a longstanding previous working relationship with this group that happens to be offshore and they've developed multiple products together, really what you're, you, the thing you're dealing with in early stages is you want a mind meld between the team. And you want very high bandwidth, low latency communications between the team. That is just hard to achieve telephonically or over VC or any of these things where you've just got time and distance that no matter how the technology, how good the technology may be today, it is really, really hard to get that kind of communication going. So again, the only exception I will see is like somebody's worked with this team for 10 years and they've developed multiple products together, then I'd consider it. Otherwise, I'd just, I wouldn't do it at all. Yeah, to add to that point, actually, of, of the team being together, you know, at Google, if we, something became really important, we would actually put all the people in the same room because actually having people be you know, in separate rooms, it turned out to be a huge disadvantage in communication. And that's because they're like 20 feet apart. <laughs> right? If you put them on the opposite side of the planet, it's a whole other game. right? There's latency with time zone. It, it just mucks up the whole communication. I, I agree. Thanks. <laughs> this is a little orthogonal, perhaps. But I'd be very interested to hear from each of you that uh, aside from your own companies, who do you think are the really hot startups to be working for today? You're talking to people who start companies. They don't work for other people. <laughs> you know, they aren't going to do that. I guess I've seen the ones that look like they have you know, big potential or really solid or whatever. Uh, A lot so of buzz. So, 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 you know, to, to throw in the plug, if, if you weren't going to apply to Scavenger, you know, <laughs> jobs at scavenger.com, then I, I think the, uh, I, I mean, I think the companies that are really interesting are, 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 are probably the ones you hear about a lot, but companies like Square um, that are doing things in mobile payments, um, uh, you know, we're a location-based company. I, I think that mobile payments are going to be one of the things that tie, 
you know, social to making it actually work in offline commerce. Um, and, and so any company in, in, in that space, um, and Square is sort of a leader there, I think would be fascinating. Um, and I don't know if you guys have any others. But. You know, it's funny. I'm, so thank you, Seth, for giving me like 30 seconds to think. Um, <laughs> because again, as a VC, you're spending most of your time selecting what you hope are the best companies and then trying to assist them to make them successful. So mentioning something outside the portfolio actually takes a lot of like synapses firing. Um, but there's a company downstairs that I've, I admire from afar. They've, they've, they've raised their money. It's a, it's a mobile gaming company. I do some gaming investing. It's called Pocket Gems. And I just think they're on fire. I think they're great. And they, they, that category monetizes well. Um, so I like, that's a company that I happen to like. I don't know whether anybody's ever heard of them, but um, they're quite successful. So I think anything to do with mobile, location, social, or games, those four things. If I get you that can picture think of something, There's the first slide. <laughs> yeah. Mobile, social, gaming, location. Yeah. So if you can come up with an idea that integrates mobile, social, and games, go for it. And you, colors. <laughs> colors, yeah, that yes. too. <laughs> okay. Another question, or are you? Uh, unless uh, the, the last panelist had any ideas. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I could name off the obvious companies, depending on what stage. You know, you've got Facebook and Twitter and Foursquare. Others are all obviously really hot companies. Um, but if you want earlier stage things, uh, you know, I, I actually I don't spend that much time thinking about the early stage companies that aren't YC. You know, I mean, I mentioned Dropbox earlier. I think they're going to be huge, um, and as well as quite a few of our, our other companies. But I don't I don't have any great examples that come to mind for you, unfortunately. Okay, as someone who views himself as a young entrepreneur and has many, many ideas every week at least, what are some tips that you guys have for like self-regulating your ideas and, and, and junking the ones that, because um, often I'll, I'll be very um, idealistic and optimistic about things just because I'm in the moment of thinking about the idea. So what are some tips about weeding out just, just completely, obviously bad ones? I, um, I can answer this one uh, at least first. <laughs> Because people come to me all the time and ask me exactly that question. And I tell them uh, it's sort of like if it's the only thing you can think of. If you wake up every morning and that's all you can think about, then that's the one to go with. If you have 10 ideas and you think they're all kind of uh, pretty good but uh, not sure, or I'm not going to leave my, my existing job to go do this, forget it. Don't do it. It's got to be an idea that you just cannot stop thinking about and you have to do it. When you have that feeling, that's the one. I would actually argue, this I don't mean to sound rude, that the profile of the personality you're talking about that you have is not complete as a successful entrepreneur. Um, it's not the idea factory. It's pairing yourself with somebody that's really good at focusing and getting a co-founder is incredibly important for your personality type. Um, the, most of the people that I know that are idea factories are not the guys that are great at starting and executing on companies because they can't stay focused on making an idea happen. And again, persistence is one of those key things that makes entrepreneurs successful because, look, startups go through deserts, big deserts where nothing feels repeatable and easy and like maybe you're getting a little bit of sales, but it doesn't feel like you figured out the real formula. Well, an idea person like yourself immediately jumps to what other ideas might we do? Um, and sometimes that's good, but most of the time it's actually bad. Um, most of the time, persistence does carry the day with a combination of exploring. And it's that balance that is really important and, and the art of it. And so I would say to you, get a co-founder that's different than you that can help kind of shape and pare down those ideas um, and kind of tamp down the factory. Yeah, thank you very much. That's excellent. Um, just a wondering, like, how do you guys see about health, just like your own health in, in terms of uh, doing startups? Do you sacrifice your health to, to I mean, like... Yeah. No, this is a huge deal. I mean, I don't mean to jump into it already, but I'll tell a personal story. And I don't want... I tell this only because it... Um, I regret it. Um, I had... Uh, I was a competitive skier in college. I had a huge ski accident, fell 300 feet down a chute through rocks and was lucky to be alive. And I blew up my knee and I had reconstructive knee surgery. Um, and I had the surgery a week before we started pitching JotSpot on our VC uh, 
roadshow, essentially, where we're going to the roadshow. And I, instead of delaying it, I did all the pitches, and we got the company going, and we kind of went, and I put all of my health stuff on hold. It took me seven years, as a result, to recover from this fully. Um, and so I've made a commitment, like, never again am I doing that. And it's really tough, because for me, for me, what, um, what motivates me is my commitment to my team um, when I'm doing these startups. And so I, I did the thing I shouldn't have done. I kind of sacrificed my own <laughs> health in that particular case, because I felt so obligated to show up for the team. And that was just a bad choice. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think um, it's a very short-term optimization to sacrifice your health because you have to recognize all of your abilities, your, your mental capacity, your, your emotional capacity to handle things is going to come from your health. So if you're, if you're extremely unhealthy, I don't think you're going to be able to persevere, which, you know, as Joe pointed out, is like kind of the key thing you need to do. Are you going to be able to make it through that desert if you're, if you're half dead? Uh, and, and it's bad for the team too, I think, because then you're setting a bad example for everyone else where you're, you're kind of implicitly telling them that they should be also sacrificing their health, right? So, uh, and it, one, of the, one of the few pieces of advice we give the, the YC companies for the summer is basically, or not few pieces of advice, few activities they're allowed to do. It's like, you just spend all of your time working, uh, I forgot what the other thing is, <laughs> and, then, and then go outside, get exercise, basically. It's, it's, it's crucial, I think, if you're indoors the whole time, you're just going to go insane and, and feel terrible. Yeah, I, I, I buy into the physical activity thing a, a, a ton. I mean, I, I, I would recommend if you're doing a startup, put yourself on a running regimen or, or, or swimming or biking or whatever, um, uh, partially to stay healthy, but partially because physical activity is an awesome time to be thinking about things or not thinking about anything and letting your mind reset, um, but also expanding that to your team. Um, uh, you know, at Scavenger, we have, we have team hikes. Um, we're doing a 200-mile uh, running race uh, next weekend with six of us where we're all hopping in a van and uh, you sort of relay from a mountain to the beach uh, 200 miles in 24 hours and and if you can keep the entire team active and healthy um, you know it's, it's it's no surprise and there's a lot of data out there to show that people who are active and healthy are happier and more productive and, and you want people to be you know to be healthy you want them to be focused and dedicated but but definitely healthy and, and physical activity is is a great way to, to help make that happen. Uh, well, two good friends of mine uh, in college, we created a product line for next-gen disc golfing accessories, and we actually won first, per first place in the business concept contest. So my question is, what, who should we talk to to get funding? Like, what are good companies to, like, <laughs> like you, <laughs> like, who, who are good people to talk to? I mean, we're just, we're trying to get funding to take to the next step, manufacturing, prototyping, shipping, all that. Um, one of the things you'll find, at least at the firm level, is uh, firms like to invest, the old adage, like invest in what you know. And so if you look through you know, all these funds, all the angels, they, most of them have big portfolio pages. I would spend some time um, looking through and seeing if you see anything that at least is approximately similar. Like, for example, Google Ventures has nothing in something that involves retail sales or something that involves... Um, Broadly speaking, something non-technical. We're probably not a good fit in that particular case because you're just gonna you're gonna be swimming heavily uphill, and you know, VCs like it or not are pattern matchers based upon the limited amount of time they have. And like, is this a pattern that feels familiar and where I can apply learnings from one experience to another to help accelerate the progress of the company? And so, for me, if I were if I were you, I would basically spend time looking through the portfolio pages of a lot of different funders and narrow it down to approaching those that basically have something that's analogous in some way. The other thing you might try is just building the business on your own. I mean, I don't know too much about the disc golf space, but I can imagine that it would be a lot easier to raise funding if you already had uh, an established online business where you've, you've demonstrated you know, just running it out of your apartment or something that you have a market. Yeah, we've made proto a prototype of the backpack we've taken out to market and stuff, and we've been estimated about 50 grand to complete you know, the first thousand backpacks after shipment. And I mean, we can't really do that on our own. So that was, this is actually, this is, be able to do it with I don't know. friends and whatnot, right? Uh, not college. <laughs> okay. Well, what, I, I actually, I would think there's a, there's a broader point in here which I feel like is 
oftentimes we get pitches for businesses that are interesting lifestyle businesses where people, I think, would make, it would make a great lifestyle business, but probably isn't a venture-backed business. Um, where a venture-backed business, again, you're going to want to see a return on your money and a high likelihood that there's a multitude of buyers at almost every stage of the company. We know and, there is. Um, but, but the thing is, you know, the, the question is, you always have to also believe that the business has a chance of being huge. And so a lot of times we run into companies that would be are great businesses if the person's motivation wasn't getting on the front page of TechCrunch. Um, and instead, the motivation was, I want to draw as large a salary as I possibly can and just have a business that throws off a ton of cash, but I don't need to be on the, you know, the cover of TechCrunch. I just want to have a, bi a great business. Um, and so it's oftentimes... Um, you know, there's some counseling around like, look, I like your business, it's just not the right one to invest in, but make it a great lifestyle business and I think you'll be generating a bunch of cash. Okay, so we have five minutes left, so we're going into lightning round now. That means the questions are like 15 seconds and the answers are like 45 seconds. only one seconds. person answers. Yeah, only one person answers 45 seconds, go. Um, okay, so Seth, you took money from Highland Ventures and you kind of closed with saying if you can take money from a big venture fund, you know, a couple billion dollar fund, you're taking like, you know, a, I don't know, 250 or 500K from a couple billion dollar fund, that that's a good way to go. But there's a whole other side to this where um, if, you know, you're putting yourself in a position where if Highland isn't interested or potentially one partner at that firm isn't interested in doing a follow-on round, then, you know, can kind of kill your company. And so, like, Paul, you guys, as I understand, have a policy where um, you don't do follow-on rounds like that. If you guys don't mind just talking about that other side of, of that kind of investment. Right. Well, that's certainly part of the reason we do that is because there is this issue. If you do get you know, one round from a, from a VC and then they don't join in the second round, that sends a pretty negative signal uh, to other VCs because like the people who know you best don't want to don't want to invest. And so, right, why, why Combinator is, I mean, we give a small amount of money, but the real value is actually the, the, um, the advice and connections and network and everything else. And, and so, yeah, as part of that, we don't have any follow on funding activity so that there is no conflict of interest there. There's no negative signal that like, oh, we didn't choose to join in on that round uh, and we're able to help connect people with the best VCs. This might help the disc golf gentleman, but when do you know to uh, look for investors and when do you know to throw your idea on Kickstarter and what are some pros and cons of each? So uh, I'll, I'll jump in on this one. Um, uh, start looking for an investor as soon as one of them will give you money. Uh, that, that, that would be my, 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 my general advice. Uh, that, that, that there's there's a, a continuing trend um, to, to bootstrap and to try and not take money, and I'm, I'm totally in the opposite camp. If you can get money at good terms, it's going to make your life easier. The help they're going to give you is going to be great. The credibility is awesome. And it, you know, if, if you can bootstrap, then take the money and just don't spend it on the things you would have been able to bootstrap. Spend it on, on something else. So as soon as humanly possible and start trying right away. Hi. Um... When you're uh, working uh, nights and week, uh, weekends and you put in some uh, amount of work, at what point do you worry about not infringing some obscure IP and things like that? Never. <laughs> like, don't waste your time. Okay. You are infringing on IP, there's no question. <laughs> <laughs> so let me reiterate because the gentleman in front of me asked the question about bootstrapping, but that was my question, so I'm going to ask it again. Um, do we always have to raise money? Because lately there is a trend about bootstrapping. Is it for real or it was just, you know, a factor of the tough economic times? I, I think bootstrapping is for real. As an entrepreneur, look, I think the, um, the kind of macro trends out there, you have large cap tech companies like Google, like Microsoft, um, like Facebook, like Yahoo, who have accumulated a massive amount of Apple, have, have accumulated a massive amount of cash on their balance sheets, so small Small acquisitions are things which um, those companies are likely to continue doing over the next two, three years. Um, so bootstrapping really, the benefit of bootstrapping is it allows for relatively small acquisitions where you own a good, you know, the majority of the company to be really beneficial for you and cheap for the company. So they preserve a wide range of early exit options. Um, taking money definitely narrows range of exit options just because there's a higher hurdle now that you have to be bought at. Um, so I, I'm still a big fan of bootstrapping as an investor because it lowers the risk of the investor investing because you usually have more data to invest on. 
Okay, last question over here. I'm currently looking for one or more co-founders. Right now it's just myself. And to be brutally honest about my skills, I think um, I, would, I excel most at more of a product design, uh, product manager type of role. I do have a technical background, and I can do the technical stuff, but I just feel I excel more at designing the product and the features. Do you, do you recommend I look more for a business background, a, a person with a business background or a technical background? I, I think, yeah. I mean, it's tricky to find anyone, right? But I, I think improving your own technical skills is the thing to do right away, and then Probably, I mean, it depends what you're building, obviously. Like, it depends on the market. It depends what are the needs that are going to make your business successful, right? But if there is a big technology component, I think it's pretty important that your co founder also be technical. Okay, we are out of time. Uh, um, thank you so much for staying with us and thank our panel. <laughs>